wildlife biologist for um, Detroit Lakes and um, uh, Hamden Slough National Wildlife Refuge, Detroit Lakes Wetland Management District. And Rebecca is going to give us a little bit more information about uh, what what this whole initiative is about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pauline. Can everybody hear me okay? You think that'll work? All right. I apologize. I'm going to be flipping through notes. We've got a mouse to run and a screen to look behind me at, so uh, we'll see how coordinated I can be. Um, can we dim the lights? Does that... I don't know if that'll make some of a difference, but I realize my title slide is a little faded for this. Hopefully the rest I, I of them will... I think it's all or nothing. All or none? Especially okay. given the sun here. All right, sounds good. Well, as Pauline had said, um, I'm gonna give you a background on how the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative kind of came to fruition back in 2012, and then just lead you very quickly and concisely though, through some of the major steps that we've taken to get to where we are literally um, in this uh, lunchroom, in this classroom at, in Fergus Falls today. So Pauline gave a really good background on kind of what went on pre-settlement. Um, she has quite the way with words, but really this uh, slide right here is just to recap that we all know about the loss of our native grasslands and prairies throughout the, not only the upper Midwest, but the United States. Um, she mentioned Iowa, greater than 99.8% of the prairie lost. Minnesota's right up there at greater than 99% of the prairie lost. And unfortunately, in the past five to 10 years, we know that the Dakotas are kind of on that trend or on that track. Um, but what's really good to know and to remember is our organizations, many of us sitting here, we work for agencies or organizations that have been trying to put this habitat back on the ground, right? Um, speaking for the Fish and Wildlife Service, because that's who I work for right now, uh, you know, we were planting grass back in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, but we were planting grass. As you all know, a lot of our restoration or reconstruction philosophies has changed over the past years and at quite a pace that a lot of times the science hasn't quite caught up to us yet. We have been trying different things at our own individual stations, maybe at our own prairie plots at home and just trying to continually learn. But I, I really think the science hasn't caught up to us yet. And this really became kind of an eye-opener or relevant when back in, I think, 2010 or 2011, speaking again for the Fish and Wildlife Service, Region 3 did a field station assessment where our leadership came and talked to our stations and asked, what are your main science needs? What are your greatest unknowns? What are you working on but you still have a lot of questions about? And overwhelmingly, one of those number one answers was the art, the science of prairie reconstruction. And we got to talking and it became very clear that others had these same questions. We had been working collaborative, collaboratively with um, other partners on managing native prairie but we found in those collaborations and talks that there were a lot of the same questions that still existed when it came to planting, restoring, reconstructing prairie. Um, one other thing that makes this really, really important in the work that we do, Pauline alluded to our decreasing budgets, right? But a lot of the prairies that we're trying to restore or reconstruct today cost a lot more than they did back when we were planting two, three, four grasses and sweet clover. So we have to do a better job at what we're restoring and where we're doing that at. And we felt that in addition to there being um, ways of learning with having discussions and observing that we really needed to catch the science up. And so a few of us got together and we decided you know, how, how do we do this? How, to, how do we 
still meet our reconstruction goals, but be cost effective in that reconstructive um, practice. Again, we had a lot of partners on board. There are a lot of people interested. I think, again, as Pauline had said, that's reflected in the uh, participation and the attendance today. So we decided in 2012, here it comes, that we were going to host a structured decision-making workshop. Now, I will not get into the ins and outs of structured decision, decision making, but uh, uh, Melinda Knutson or any of the other experts in the room, if you have uh, questions about this process or this approach to problem solving, um, please hit her up because this is something that we've adopted and that we feel is, is really beneficial, and especially at this workshop when, when kicking this off the ground. So what structured decision making is, and it, it's a, it's an approach to clarify the problem, and it identifies next steps to take towards solving that prog problem. And so we had about 25 participants in the room, and we held discussions that were really carefully thought, thought out. We followed a structured approach, um, and this is an iterative process. So we can go back and revisit a lot of those decisions, those questions, um, the discussions that we met and, and follow back up and reassess and reevaluate. And I want to tie that back into why we're here today. So this is our follow-up. We've been talking for the last three years, um, our pre-op group, about this workshop and, and how we've gone from 2012 to 2015. And that was the impetus for today. One of the strengths of the workshop that we had in 2012 is we had about 25 participants. And we had participants from uh, federal agencies, uh, state agencies, nonprofits, other types of organizations, and we had a diversity of skill levels and knowledges out there so that we had biologists, practitioners, decision makers, um, researchers, uh, and, and others in the room. So we had the whole gamut of people there to participate in these discussions. So really what, what we did was we centered our entire workshop around a two-part problem. And we had developed this as a small group prior to the workshop. But you'll see the two parts are, what is the most cost-effective way to establish and manage prairie reconstructions? And then are we meeting those reconstruction goals and objectives? Now, our discussions seem to always center on what are our limitations or our challenges in prairie reconstruction, because that's what we immediately think of when we try to accomplish something, right? Sometimes we know what we want to do, but there's a lot of roadblocks in its way. So that was really the, uh, the basis for, for our discussions, was talking about those limitations. Now really to sum, sum up three and a half very intense days of discussion, what we came out with were four overarching uncertainties. So this is what we would call our big fish questions. Okay, really big questions that those of us in the room are not gonna answer by just talking it out. But then we also had a recommendation to form an advisory team and to work through these problems, these questions incrementally, piece by piece, taking really crucial steps to try to continue to gain information to help um, back and, and, and solve those problems. So here are our overarching uncertainties. And you will see that a lot of them, I believe three of the four, really come back to cost. Or cost is, is one of the limitations or concerns. So does a high cost planting regime that meets our objectives lead to a lower cost long-term management regime? How do the abiotics of a reconstruction site affect the reconstruction outcome? What are the best post-planting management techniques? 
What are the best post-planting management techniques, and should I be using them to ensure a successful prairie reconstruction at minimal cost? And how much diversity is enough for a sustainable prairie? How diverse can we make a prairie with the least amount of money? So those were our overarching ones. And we had someone from USGS, Jill Gannon. She spe specialized in, in, in modeling these problems out. And she came out with some different processes or different ways that we could advance on a larger scale, more collaboratively, how to attain or go about finding answers to those big fish questions. Um, but what we also had to take a step back to get us to that place where we actually felt we were ready for something like that was to form PREAT, or our Prairie Reconstruction Initiative Advisory Team. So that's where we are today, and uh, Pauline had had our advisory team stand up. But what PREAT was done, is, is doing is it was performed to continue this process while keeping within the original intent of the workshop, okay? We had great workshop notes. We had pages and pages of compiled notes, kind of a record of those four days. And from that, we had developed a charter to actually guide our group, and I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But it was to maintain the intent of that workshop by following the charter. We have 23 members. We've that's you know, changed a little bit throughout the, the past three years, but we've been anywhere between 20 and 25. 23 members, um, and, and you see the affiliations there. It's not just a service thing, it's not just state. We've got as many partners and such that we, uh, that we have been able to um, have in a group to still make it functional as a, as a business type group. Um, we cover right now our membership in that advisory team covers the states that are in blue. Uh, our area of influence, if you will, just really quickly that we picked, I wouldn't say quickly, but that we picked out um, at the beginning of the year is, is the, the geographical boundaries of Region 3 and Region 6 of the Fish and Wildlife Service. So those of us on the advisory team are trying to maintain communication throughout uh, the field stations outside of those, uh, those states colored in blue as well. Within PREAT, we have a leadership team, and then we also have subgroups that have been formed. Think of them as committees, and I'll talk about those a little bit later, and then you'll hear about their specific projects as well. And then we also have a group that we've um, creatively called the All Members Group, and this is a group of an additional 15 or so members that are still really interested in what PREAT is doing, but they wanted to maintain their participation at a more minimal level. So they wanted to keep in the know, keep on what they were doing. They've been, um, they've, they've came to some of our field tours and such, but they just really didn't want that, that level of, uh, of direct involvement at the time. So our total membership is roughly 40. Really quickly, I, I call it managing pre-app business because really what we're doing is we're trying to, as informal and as as informal as it is, and though it's not an agency specific thing, we're still trying to stay on track and keep running it um, business like. Where you can see we have monthly conference calls and we take notes. We have what's called a project record. This is like a record of decision. It, it relays and repeats the information in the charter, like the roles and responsibilities, but it also records uh, major decisions that are made. Uh, where we store our data, who's part of what small group, who's on the leadership team, things like that. And so this is something that's um, very dynamic and that we update as changes are made and as important um, decisions are added. We also have a SharePoint site and the charter, as I said, um, to just formulate and, and show the structure of our group. Uh, and then, of course, because we're all, you know, across a large geographic area, emails are equally important. And then we have quarterly webinars for all members. Now, I want to say one quick um, note to remember, and I think Pauline had already mentioned this, but keep in mind 
that those of us that are involved in this group, we're in this group because we choose to. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, one of the duties that we're assigned as a responsibility of our, of our job. This is an extra um, group, an extra initiative that we belong to because we want to. So we all had to get supervisor approval. We don't get funding to do this type of thing. This is something we do, um, you know, within the scope of our work. Now just a little bit about the philosophies and scope of our advisory team, and this is directly from the charter, and this gives you a little bit of a, an idea of really where we're shooting to go. Um, our purpose is to identify and take steps to resolve uncertainties in the process of prairie reconstruction so that efforts are cost effective and meet management objectives. So cost effective and meeting our objectives, they sure come up a lot. They came up prior to our first workshop. They help form our problem statement. And in our overarching certainties, cost and management objectives, meeting those objectives, um, we're in three or four of those. In, in that, we seek a greater understanding of the functions, drivers, and limitations of prairie reconstruction. So again, those things that are holding us back, those things we don't know, those things that are influencing our reconstruction success more than others. To further define, refine, and determine whether underlying objectives are the underpinnings of all prairie reconstructions. <coughs> and to investigate these problems through scientific experimentation, documentation, field visits, literature searches, and protocol development and application. I apologize, I can't see my screen. So again, some of these, these things are really big, but there are little steps that we can take towards finding out more information. And so, once more, that's the idea behind the subgroups. And uh, the needs and the focus of the subgroups all stem from those workshop uh, the workshop-driven uh, overarching uncertainties, some of our low-hanging fruits that we thought we could attain, and then needs that derive from our subsequent uh, conference calls. So here are our subgroups and the associated projects, and I'm just going to touch on these really quickly, just say what's on the slide basically, because you are going to hear in more detail from these folks. Um, immediately after me. But we have five very active uh, subgroups right now, and again, these are just folks who have selected um, these, these low-hanging fruits, if you will, from our advisory team. So the first one is develop a prairie literature database. The second is to showcase and discuss prairie reconstructions at various sites. So that's more of an information sharing um, type, type venture. Uh, three, develop a tool to collect standardized information during the reconstruction process. And that would be our reconstruction database. Conduct a retrospective analysis to predict the success of a prairie reconstruction. And that's a current research project that we have going on. And then finally, to develop monitoring protocols to assess prairie reconstruction success. And this is related to both the database and the research projects. So some of these are, are quite interrelated, and some of our groups have kind of melded from three into one or two. Now that's taking us from 2012 to where we are today. Those are our five main focal points that we're working on um, that we have a lot of involvement in. And again, you're going to hear from these subgroups uh, after me. But keep in mind that we have you here today because we've made some of these decisions thus far on where we want to tackle and what we want to um, see as the drivers for this group. But we've asked you all here today for your input as well. And you'll have an opportunity as uh, Pauline had mentioned in the uh, World Cafe setting that we have scheduled for later this afternoon. And we want to hear what questions you have and what limitations might still be keeping you from attaining success in your prairie reconstructions. And we want to find out in what ways you think we could all collaborate on something moving forward. 
So please look forward to that and be thinking about that as you have just heard um, this, this presentation here and as you listen to the uh, presentations forthcoming. And I just want to leave you with a couple quotes that I think just speak volumes for the prairie reconstruction effort that we're all undertaking and what's still left to work on. So the first one is, looking around the room at all the flip charts, lists, it's amazing how much our managers have to do and think about related to prairie reconstruction. And secondly, there have been many discussions about various aspects of reconstructions, but few conversations like this one are trying to pull all the steps into one picture of success. So that's all I have for you today. Does anyone have any questions about the initiative or the advisory team at all? Um, I can try to answer or one of the other folks in the group can, otherwise we'll get ready for the small group presentations. Okay, hearing none, we will move on. Thank you, Becky. Um, this is, um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so I'd like to point out, first of all, there's some people who are, have been coming in since the presentation started. There's some chairs here. We're going to take a break. So after the break, you might want to choose a spot that's um, a little easier to sit in than back in the back of the room. Um, we will convene back here at 